whole film, I think, is rich with sort of ideas about where you could go in the worlds that Neil Gaiman has, you know, sort of introduced in the script. Oh, Tristan, a shooting star. It very much needed to have vi the visual effects element to it. A lot of magic was introduced in the script, a lot of ideas that uh, portrayed landscapes. They were all new visions that um, didn't exist in the real world, and so therefore needed augmenting the visual effects. <laughs> scale you go you have to either find extraordinary sets or you have to go visual effects uh, visual effects are very expensive we've been fortunate on this movie because London and England has a wealth of riches for us to go to and see these really ex and have these extraordinary experiences there's a lot of directors out there that have a very conventional idea of how effects can be used and Matthews was very much a sort of innocent approach to visual effects, which sort of uh, was very interesting at the initial meetings. Only use CGI if you have to. I mean, if it's literally physically impossible to do it in camera or way too expensive to do it for real. At the very beginning, his approach was, if we can do it in camera, if we can shoot an in-camera effect, let's use that and let's, you know, incorporate that into the live action and approach the effects that way. Lamia forms the inn. His initial approach, his idea always, was to take a house, burn it, and then run the film in reverse. And we had come up with very sort of organic, growing materials that would form the house. And in the end, we, we did a very simple test, which was make a, an inn out of phone call, set it alight, film it, and run the film backwards. And that f served the basis for the whole design of that effect, which, you know, is the simplistic way in which Matthew thought about all the effects. It's pretty hard to get a 180-foot galleon flying around in the air, so we had to go CG. But, you know, the actual decking we built, you know, anything we could build, we did. It's really spectacular and very complicated, and that's one of the learning experiences that Matthew went through in this film, is, is that the entire stage is green screened, and in the middle is a giant ship. And shooting visual effects, you don't get to do very often on independent budgets, and you certainly don't get to do it on that kind of scale. So Matthew not only had to jump in the pool, he had to jump in with one of the great actors of our time, and a limited time period to get it done. So it was a really, f it, that ship was lively. All the floors and the, and the walls and the ceilings are all green screen, but you still have this boat which you're on, so it's still, it's not like, it's not like you have nothing to use. We already planned it in advance, so basically put out uh, what we call tracking markers, which is, you see on, on the screen, we got all these orange and purple crosses, and uh, we also place out uh, LEDs, little, little lights. Uh, the reason we place, uh, place those out is because they show up um, much better when a shot is out of focus. If, if um, the markers work well, if everything is in, in focus, but because of the low light scenario, so you get in the studio, you, you normally get quite short focus range, range and um, that's where you use the LEDs. And they're basically there as aids for us to, to track the camera moves, to recreate the camera moves, to get the same parallax change happening behind it. This is what we call a CG takeover, where you basically you start, start on the practical set, which was sh shot in Pinewood on the green screen stage. Um, everything below this line here is now computer generated. 
all the rain, all the sky, and all that. The ship itself probably consists of 20 odd different passes with reflection passes, the interactive light, lighting from the lightning strikes, uh, get like a wet look to make it look like it's raining and all that. And behind all of that, you get the, the environment. It's quite cloudy, as you can see. So, um, but it's basically everything is in there. You get the, the horizon line with the mountains in there. You get probably 20 different parts of clouds in there, which we basically build up and and um, and composite together to to make it all sit sit in nicely. A lot of people have seen the movie. Go, God, like that, those landscapes. Who designed them? How did you build them? They just look amazing. I'm going. Well, that's Scotland. Or that's Iceland. So. It's paid off, especially in America. The Americans who've seen the movie now are they're, they're sort of they can't believe what we made it for, and, and they think they think it's probably got 1,500 visual effects shots in it, but it hasn't. Taking the existing environment, the Isle of Skye or Iceland, and having to reproduce that in a certain way, so that you still believe that it's that world, that stormhold environment, um, that was probably the hardest challenge. We always wanted to bookend both the start and the end of the shot with a live action element. Because I always feel that you start from a live action element, you introduce that world immediately where you are, and then journey to the created image. So there was a lot of planning up front, there was a lot of development in what the sort of environments should look like, what sort of terrain we should be travelling through what the visibility should be, when we should reveal the castle and what sort of other life exists within you know, the Stormhold area. Matthew Vaughan was quite keen to have lots, lots of these um, establishing shots, geography shots basically, explaining where we are and where we're going and all that sort of stuff. So that was quite a big challenge to, to create all this, these digital environments. Let's at least finish the champagne. This is actually shot on the green screen stage in Pinewood because um, they decided quite late on that they wanted this shot. What you see here is basically set up the wall. Behind this, the trees that we zoom over, is a helicopter move from a completely different location. And everything else behind um, the tree line is computer generated. So this is a two and a half D map painting of um, the market town. And this is our environment, our techno environment, which we called it, uh, onto projector matte paintings, onto geometry. A complete CG uh, version of the Stormhold Castle uh, with projector map paints in the background, and then into the scene, which is obviously played from a from a hanging rig uh, on on location. Action. Where is Secundus? We need to fool the all the audience that this is an actual camera move and not something that's computer generated. So we've um, spent a long time on, on creating these environments and they're basically based on, uh, on photography and uh, scan data basically from an airplane. Um, so we basically bought a map uh, from a survey company who've done a survey of, of the Isle of Skye so you get the f uh, photography uh, with, with basically height data uh, combined that we then basically uh, apply to our 3D software and stitch it all together so we can put our camera through it. The Witcher's Lair, yeah, there's a lots, lots of magic ideas. I mean, it's a very contained, fantastic set built by Gavin Bouquet, designed. Um, so it was more about what happens to the characters within it. Uh, Impusa fires flames, there's lots of wire removals in terms of fighting uh, Septimus with the, with the knife and everything. Um, Yvain shines in it. So it's very much magic effects within that environment. And also, given the size of the set, there are a lot of set extensions done, topping up the, the roof and uh, adding bits of you know, architecture that weren't, weren't built. So, what happens now? We have to learn to live with each other. Forever? Ugh. When we started The Ghosts, Matthew wanted this alternate break so that you instantly could tell that you were cutting to a shot of a demised ghost. So it needed to have a certain look. And when we first started the project, uh, we invented all sorts of different ideas. For instance, each ghost, each prince, dies in a particular way. One gets frozen, one gets burnt. And so we thought that there 
their limbo, their, their before they go to heaven or hell, would, be, would reflect that, so that they would be in a constant state of flux. So in other words, you would be cutting to the prince that gets burned, and he would suddenly erupt into flames. But then the next time you cut back to him, you know, he would, he would be normal. From that development, um, it was deemed too complicated, and the look needed to be more about the performance of the comedic actors. And so very much the effects came back from their initial you know, design, and it was very much left to a very simple, transparent ghost look with the uh, comedy value emphasized more than the effect. Guys, where, 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 oh, there, there. you going to come up and have a look at this? No, thank you. Mm, suit yourself. <laughs> hey, guys, guys, come on, come on, you got to come up and see this. No, thank you. Pervert, suit yourself. Basically, after I die, um, I'm a ghost, obviously, and I'm travelling back to Stormhold with Mark Strong, who is the victor and the sort of, you know, the winner, in effect. Um, and uh, being naked in a jockstrap on the back of a horse of Mark Strong has its amusing moments. So yeah, it was, it was good fun. Stardust is a big project. I mean, we had 720 shots actually around in the film, but I think we, we must have worked on somewhere around 800. And due to the sort of narrative process of editorial, some shots, you know, came and went, but it ended up being around 720 shots. On the film, we used seven English companies around London, and it's, it's down to technical approach when certain assets are made that enable you to do a certain type of shot it's it's crazy to sort of advertise that over several companies it's more because companies work in using proprietary software doing a lot of things in-house it's essential to keep those shots grouped together so very much it was a matter of going through the film with tim field my producer breaking down what segments could be grouped together so that each individual company could develop their own sets of tools and then it would be very clear that they could work on that type of shot. So we would break down all the shimmers in the film. We would break down the end finale. And obviously there would be a lot of crossovers between companies, but it would be crossovers where elements were needed that the companies were already developing, but there were also lots of elements together from various different companies that were required for the shot. So it's very much working from a tool set and uh, making sure that the, the workflow is consistent throughout. And that's the best way of guaranteeing you know, the consistency of effect throughout the show. One of most hopes as a writer is that an audience is entertained. <laughs> so it's kind of a crass answer, but it's true, you know. I you know, I know how I feel when I go into the cinema and I just think, yeah, I'm really enjoying this. I have had so much fun on it and really got on with it. I feel like I've got on with everyone and and it's a great crew. It centers on real uh, people who are having real relationships with each other. Um, and that is the most engaging thing of all. It's a lot of work for everybody, and everybody has to work really hard to get it done. I think it's a, a fantastic film in the sense that it shows various elements of another world that people have never seen before. It's a proper feel-good movie without being a romantic comedy. It's just, you just come out and you go, that was a fun two hours. 
to spend. It's not going to change your life, it's not going to change the world, but it's entertaining. It's never been the most popular book, but the people who love Stardust love it more than anything.